here. So thank you. Um, welcome to the Eleanor Franklin Roosevelt Democratic Club. Uh, for those who don't know, we're one of the oldest Democratic clubs here in Prince George's County. Last year we just celebrated our 40th anniversary. Um, so we're really excited about that. Uh, for those who are new, I'm Nicole. I am the president of the club. We have several of our board members here. Conrad Hurling is one of our vice presidents. Daryl Pennington in the back is also one of our vice presidents. And Katie, um, also as you checked in, you probably met Austin, who is our treasurer. Um, and also, if you have not paid your dues yet, as well as Ryan over there, who is our uh, corresponding secretary and is also videotaping uh, the meeting today to post on our Facebook page. <laughs> and we have Greenville Access in the back who's also videotaping, which we're really happy to have him here. Uh, it is 2018, and so dues are now due. If you have not paid your dues, please see Austin in the back. Uh, dues are $10 per person and $5 for our student and more seasoned members. And so if you haven't paid your dues yet for this year, now is the time to pay your dues. Okay, so we always start off all of our meetings by doing the Pledge of Allegiance. So if everyone can stand. And Conrad, you want to lead us with the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic which is stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, our recording secretary, uh, Keith, is not able to be with us this afternoon, so we don't have the minutes from the last meeting. Um, but I don't know uh, if our treasurer, Austin, do you have a financial report? We have $3,900 in the bank and no bills. Okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, welcome again. I am so excited that you know we have had various um, candidates who are running for county executive joining us uh, over the past couple of months. And I'm super excited um, to have our next candidate, who is, um, most people probably have heard the name Congresswoman Donna Edwards. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to try, she has a very extensive bio, and so I'm going to try to, <laughs> I'm going to try to do this summer here. Um, but if you don't know, um, Congresswoman Donna Edwards is a lifelong, in addition to being a former congresswoman, is a lifelong organizer and community activist. Um, she was born in North Carolina to a military family. Um, her dad was in the United States Air Force, and she traveled all across the country, but then decided after graduating from Wake Forest University to move back here to Maryland and settled here in Prince George's County, where she raised her son. Um, while here in, after moving here to Prince George's County, she worked at the United Nations Development Program early in her career, and then later on worked uh, for Lockheed Martin at the Goddard Space Flight Center, which is right down the street here, um, which sparked her interest in STEM and innovation. She obtained her law degree from the University of New Hampshire, and following law school, she was a consumer advocate for um, public citizens fighting for campaign and ethics reform. Um, she took over Big Pharma to lower the cost of prescri prescription drugs, as well as overturning their lobbying efforts to keep affordable, or not to keep affordable, arthritis medication, and wanting to keep it in the hands of seniors. She co-founded and led the National Network to End Domestic Violence, spearheading the campaign to, file, to pass the Violence Against Women Act in 1994, and also successfully taking on the NRA to keep guns out of the hands of domestic abusers. While living in her community in Fort Washington, Donna led the neighborhood residents to take on big developers at National Harbor and used her legal background to win hundreds of good union jobs, housing, and beautiful spaces for the residents there in Fort Washington to enjoy. In 2008, she was elected to Congress as the first African-American woman to represent, Maryland, um, to represent Maryland in Congress and served for five terms um, in that role. As a congressperson, she worked to make sure that Maryland schools were providing dinner to hungry students through their aftercare supporters program, working with various local nonprofits to provide stronger reentry programs for people who are returning from prison, making sure that young people have access to college and career opportunities and businesses to bring jobs in our communities. 
And I can go on and on and on and on because there's lots of other things that she's done. Um, but I know she's super excited to be here. And so we're excited to have you. And so thank you so much. And without further ado. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Nicole, thank you very much. And thank all of you for uh, coming out on this rainy um, spring day, unfortunately, <laughs> um, almost. Uh, anyway, I really appreciate uh, being here. I've been here at, at the, um, in this room, in fact, uh, a number of times, but it's good to be here with you today. Um, and so I'm not going to go through my uh, bio because I think that Nicole did a great job of that. But what I will say is that my experience growing up in a military family, my dad served for 30 years in the U.S. Air Force, and his last duty station was Andrews. And so that is actually what brought my family here and then here finally to Prince George's County. And although I went to like 14 schools when I was growing up all across the country and internationally, um, you know, when I came here and after I'd been here for about three or four years, I was like, wow, this is home. And uh, I would tell people that and they still describe me as a newcomer. Well, I've been here 35 years now and I came to the county with, as a newlywed, um, made a home here in the county and did what a lot of our residents do. I first moved into an apartment and then moved into a condo townhouse and then moved into a single family home where I raised my son. And now I'm back in kind of a condo apartment again. <laughs> Uh, my son is now 25, 29 years old, and um, he's doing really well. And I just, I feel like what the foundation that we got as a family uh, to have to live in a stable community, in a safe and healthy community, is really what brought me to public service because it enabled me to figure out how it is that I could uh, that I could best serve. And so, after my time in Congress, um, some of you may know that. Uh, so after I, I lost that, that Senate race, no big deal, um, but I decided that I was going to get in an RV and drive across the country, which is what I did. And so I went to like, I don't know, 27, 30 states, um, about as many of those national parks and, and state parks, and it gave me a lot of time to think about what I'd want to do to be able to serve my community. Um, and so after three and a half months on the road, hiking, biking, and all kinds of other things, I decided that really I wanted to come back and plant myself here in Prince George's County and figure out a way that I could serve locally. And so I'm very excited about the prospect of being the next county executive here in Prince George's County. Combining my uh, previous experience, uh, you said Lockheed Martin, Nicole, but it was actually Lockheed because it was before the merger. Um, and I started out there actually as a, as a technical writer, and then I became a data analyst. And then the next thing you know, one of these senior engineers is taking me up under the floor and we're pulling out cables and stuff. And I ended up as a project engineer at, uh, at Goddard Space Flight Center. And lo and behold, it turns out that when I was in Congress, I was, heading, I was um, the chair at one point of our space subcommittee on the Science and Technology Committee. And it was actually my experience from 30 years ago um, at Lockheed and at Goddard that really gave me a sense of the space program, and particularly here in Prince George's County where Goddard uh, provides a combination of civil servants and contractors, something like 15,000 jobs um, in, this, in this region. And so it's a really important job center uh, for us here. And I learned that and to combine what I had done previously into my work in Congress. In the same way, some of the other things that I learned as a foundation executive, uh, as a nonprofit uh, executive, I started a nonprofit organization called the National Network to End Domestic Violence. We had $1,000 in the bank and I turned it into a multi-million dollar organization. It is today the largest organization of its kind operating in every in all of the 50 states and the territories uh, in the country uh, trying to prevent domestic violence. And I helped to start that out on my deck in Fort Washington. And so, um, so those skills as an executive, as a foundation executive, giving uh, over the course of my career at the ARCA Foundation something like $50 million um, in grants to nonprofit groups all across the country, working on important public policy issues like 
saving Social Security and ending the death penalty and making sure that we had a campaign finance and ethics system that really worked for us. Well, that one we still need to work on. Um, and so uh, I feel like I bring those skills to the table and I want to apply that experience of over 25 years, 30 years, um, into the, uh, the county executive's office and into what it is that we need to do to move our county from where we are now uh, to a place that we need to be here in the 21st century. And so let me talk about that a little bit because I do have a vision for Prince George's County. I'm sure that we all have a vision as well. But my vision uh, centers around really four basic ideas. And they, I, it's what I call my big idea, Donna's big idea. And it's innovation, development, education, and accountability. And you can remember it because that's idea. I did come out of Goddard, and so we do <laughs> acronyms. Um, but innovation, development, education, and accountability. What do I mean by innovation? One, we actually have an innovation corridor in this county that has really never been galvanized in the kind of way that the corridor, the Dulles uh, corridor has been galvanized, uh, that the I-270 corridor has been galvanized. But let's think about it. We have Goddard Space Flight Center. We have amazing technology and research and business development that's going on at the University of Maryland and at Bowie State University. We have Prince George's Community College, which if you've been over to the campus lately, you can see it is turning into a technology uh, hub. And then we have a whole bunch of businesses in NOAA uh, uh, down at the, the south that is doing some amazing work in terms of our weather and our climate um, and, our sat and our satellite operations. And so we actually have the framework uh, for innovation in the county, but we haven't really sold it uh, like that. But it is an opportunity for us to bring uh, jobs and opportunity into Prince George's County in a way that we haven't done before. And so I believe that we have to invest and grow that innovation uh, framework. Uh, development. Well, let's think about development. Nicole described uh, that in my activist days living out in the community uh, over in Fort Washington. I actually helped organize um, neighborhood associations and people all along that Oxon Hill Road uh, corridor in Forest Heights before the National Harbor development was coming in. And it's because I love the idea of us doing a positive economic development. But we have to make sure that it's development that works for communities, that works for the county, and of course that works for the business community. And I thought at the time that National Harbor wasn't going to be that. If some of you remember, there was the idea floating around that it was become, going to be a Disney World over on the Potomac River. Well, thank goodness that did not happen. Uh, but the reason is because I helped to organize communities all along there uh, to try to turn it into uh, a, an economic development center that could actually work for us, produce taxpayer resources for us. And so, it is why in this campaign I have decided that I am not taking developer money. Now it's not because I don't believe in economic development, but we have had too much of a history in this county of pay to play and of a reputation for that. And in fact, even in 2017, I think we had three or four elected officials indicted uh, and convicted of crimes. That has to end because in order for us to realize our innovation goals and to realize our development goals, we have to make sure that Prince George's County really is viewed as open for business, that it's on a level playing field, and that taxpayers are going to get the benefit of the bargain. And so I've said, you know what, let's cut the umbilical cord of developer money and campaigns. And so I've decided not uh, to do that. Uh, but we do have to uh, engage in economic development, for example, where we make as a rule project labor agreements so that the people who are working on projects are paid a decent wage so that they can afford to buy things in the economy. Community benefits agreements so that when a development comes to a community, guess what? There are things that come back uh, to us. We say, you know, we do need to be able to build community centers, and we need to make sure that we are funding our education opportunities and those things. And, and we need to do it in a way that's, uh, that's green. And we need to make sure that these projects are compatible with communities. And those things can be done at the outset 
so that we're not in litigation and fighting uh, at the end. And that's the way that I view uh, development and economic development. And around our transportation corridors, where we're developing mixed income uh, housing and commercial opportunities and retail opportunities around our commercial, uh, around our transportation infrastructure. This is the way that Prince George's County can grow in the future. And in fact, we just saw a report of the development that's happening around the College Park uh, metro station. And the wrap on that, which is a true one, is that it's actually going to create jobs and that employers want to be located around a transportation hub. And it turns out it will increase ridership on metro because people are going to be living uh, right there where that metro station is. Well, Prince George's County has 16 of those all around the Beltway, the most in any jurisdiction in the region. And we need to be taking advantage of those uh, pieces of our infrastructure that will really help to grow our economy. And then, of course, we can't leave out education. Every single thing that we do hinges on having an education system that works for all of our students from, uh, from pre-K and Head Start right on up uh, through uh, high school graduation, and that we know what those graduation rates are, and that we can count on the information that we give, and that there is transparency in the way that um, the, uh, the CEO and the school board are accountable uh, to citizens here in Prince George's County. And let me just share with you, I, I think about education very personally. My parents graduated from high school. They made their way into the middle class, but the dream that they had is that their children would go on to college and do better than they did. I think that that is universal. It is what every single family, if you talk to them, it's what they want for their children. And maybe it's a four-year college, or maybe it's uh, going to a, a two-year institution and getting an associate's degree, or maybe it's going into a trade school uh, to fill all of those construction jobs because we're doing the kind of economic development uh, that we want. I believe that we can uh, do that here in Prince George's County. And let me just say, it is not just a question of money. Prince George's County spends 60% of our taxpayer dollars that go into our public school system. We also spend comparably to what others are spending in the system. But there is a problem of where we spend that money. And I would say we look at that budget with a clean slate, and we start putting money where it belongs. And that means into the, into the educators who see and touch and feel your students every single day. You know, the people who are there with them in the classroom, the people who are uh, the ones who are picking up your children um, on, on a school bus, those who are serving um, your, your uh, school lunches and breakfast in the, in the school system. We need to make sure that our resources in the system go heavily weighted uh, there. And I believe that we will begin to see much stronger school success. The greatest measure of whether a school system succeeds or not is more teachers and fewer students in the classroom. And that is just a formula for success. And I believe that we can do that. I was just at, uh, with a teacher at Duval High School, and we know that Duval has had some, uh, some challenges, but so have a lot of our schools had challenges. But I was talking with a math teacher there who used to teach four sections of geometry and two sections of algebra. Now he teaches four sections of Algebra 1 and two sections of geometry. Algebra 1 is a foundation for math. You can't work at a cash register or do anything if you don't have the fundamentals of Algebra 1. The reason that he is now teaching four sections of Algebra 1 and two sections of geometry is because so many, so many of the students were not able to meet the, te the task of passing Algebra 1. That is not a good sign for a county that wants to grow its innovation economy. And so we have to take on that challenge. And the other thing that he told me is that he has 39 children in his classroom. It is unacceptable. Uh, we have seen a time where there was a time when our classroom sizes were going down, but the fact is now they're going up. And we have teachers from kindergarten to, the, uh, to math teachers, to English teachers, all across the system, every single system, telling us that, in fact, our class sizes are going up. That is completely unacceptable. And if we want real success in our school system, 
We have to make sure that we are lowering class size so that an individual teacher knows those students who are in the classroom, knows the things that they need, and is able to teach them in the way that they can learn. I believe that we have the capacity to do that, but not under the current structure. And so we don't need to tweak the system. We need an overhaul of the system so that it begins to work for educators, for uh, uh, parents, and of course, for our students. And so we have to get education right for these other things. But the one key to that is accountability, the last uh, piece that I will talk about and then open up to questions. For too long, we have had sort of the hidden um, uh, secret in Prince George's County. Where are we spending our money? Where is that MGM money uh, coming from and going, going to? Uh, how is it that you know, there's a proposal that comes to raise taxes here or to take away services there, and how did that happen? We need a new era of accountability and transparency here in Prince George's County. We need to open up our contracting system. There are too many contractors who are working under sole source contracts and no bid contracts. And you know what happens when there's a sole source or a no bid? It means that all of us get stuck with a really, really big bill. And that has to change because we want to open up the doors of competition. I mean, no, one should, no business should be afraid of competition. And in fact, what would happen, it would mean that those uh, small businesses, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses would actually be able to compete for our contracting dollars. And let me tell you the difference it would make. I talked to a gentleman who is, um, he's like the largest vending machine operator. Not everybody's a fan of vending machines. I don't even eat out of one. But uh, some people do. He wanted to get a contract with Prince George's County because they had contracts um, in other places. Couldn't even get into the door. His largest contracts now, Prince William County, Loudoun County. Where is his business located? Right here in Prince George's County. And so we have to open up those levers uh, for competition so that we get the best bargain for our tax dollars, and then we're able to de deploy them in the right kind of way that will work uh, for all of our communities. And so that's my big idea. That is my vision for Prince George's County. It is a way I see of moving us for what is now, what are now the early days of the, or years of the 21st century into the next part of the 21st century and making sure that every single one of our students is learning in our schools so that they can uh, go on to further their education, compete for those jobs, and live and stay and work and raise their families uh, here in Prince George's County. And so I thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you right now. And I look forward to your, uh, your questions. And most importantly, on June 26th, I am going to look forward to your vote for me for County Executive of Prince George's County. Thank you very much. Okay, so I know maglev has been a huge, a huge concern. I actually first became acquainted with the maglev project when I was in Congress. I served on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. And I actually met with them, I think, my second year in Congress. And then it was really just a concept. There was nothing um, really come of it uh, at that time. And then I had an opportunity to travel to Japan on a transportation and infrastructure trip. And I actually had an opportunity to sit down with their transportation people and also to ride the maglev. And I have to tell you, I think it is incredibly impressive, transformative technology. Now, I know that there have been a lot of concerns raised in the community. A lot of that, in my view, has to do with the fact that a whole bunch of information was put out there, and it seemed like it was going to wreak havoc through so many different communities. But let me tell you about, it, especially my service on the, on the Transportation Committee. The corridor between Washington and um, Boston, the Northeast Corridor, is the most economically productive corridor in the country. But its infrastructure is falling apart. We say that people can do business in New York and Philadelphia and Boston from our region because we have the Acela and that's our high-speed train. Well, that is a joke that it's a high-speed train. 
One of the problems is that it travels on the same tracks as our freight rail, and that is very inefficient. And so the maglev is an opportunity uh, to try to create a project that will, I mean, in way into the future, uh, that will enable us to really maximize this economic corridor. And so I want to give it a shot. And I also think that in, this, in our county, when I think about our innovation corridor, we cannot be in a position of rejecting innovation. We should question innovation. We should make sure that all of our questions are answered, that projects are done in a way that are the least disruptive uh, to communities. But I really do believe that this idea, and part of it is my experience just riding on the maglev uh, in Japan, that it really does have some merit. And so I would like all of us to continue a conversation with the maglev um, uh, developers and innovators and make sure that whatever the chosen uh, route, and it actually does look like things are narrowing down to mostly underground along the pathway of the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. Um, but I'm open to, uh, to considering it, but I am really impressed with the technology. And I do know, I, when I think about some of the financial interests and other interests that are in um, the New York area and in Boston, the idea that we could encourage them to come and locate here in Prince George's County where the land is less expensive, where they get a quality uh, workforce, and uh, they know that they can also still get business done in an hour going to Boston or to, uh, to New York, I think it's very, very attractive. And it will further maximize, uh, I believe, uh, the corridor that we have that is not meeting its fullest potential right now. So thank you. Am I going to call? Okay. Right, uh, back to the mad lift, but uh, um, Governor Hogan said he's going to spend like an estimated $20 billion to produce. And also, he's also now doing $5 billion to attract this second Amazon hotel. Isn't the money better spent on updating our pre existing infrastructure and uh, uh, upgrading our school systems? Uh, uh, putting uh, energy efficient windows in government buildings, would it be better spent to spend the money uh, not on, on this um, idea, which is, well, too expensive, and invested right in the state and creating jobs right here? So, I mean, it's an interesting point that you raise, that there are, we have a lot of needs, a lot of infrastructure needs, school construction, uh, needs um, to create jobs and opportunity here in the, in the county. But what I will say is that we have to be able to, in this county, not just think about what it is that we need to do today. We have to think about how we're going to be able to build a county in this century that goes into, you know, 20, 30, 40 years down the line. We might not even see, we won't see, uh, the benefits of that, but I still think it's important for us to begin to, uh, to think well ahead of where we are. And so I'll, I'll share this with you. When you look around Prince George's County, there are a lot of really great projects that are going on, but there is no cohesion to them. You know, what is the vision for the county? Where is it that we want to be not today, but tomorrow? And so while I share your view that we have a lot of pressing needs, we have to be able to do both things, walk and chew gum. And some of that is making sure that we're allocating our resources in the school system so that we have the capital budgets over a long period of time that we need to do to engage in school reconstruction and school construction. Not just waiting until something falls apart to say, oh, okay, now we've got to build a new school or we have to fix this uh, school over here. Um, I look at the school that's right down the road from me uh, where I live, Fort Foot Elementary School. Fort Foot Elementary School, I think, probably was built in the, I don't know, 1950s or 60s. And so it really doesn't, it's not a school that has, where kids have ready access to broadband and the kinds of technologies and even facilities uh, that are actually part of this century. Those kind of things can't continue. And so I share your view that we want to make sure that we're, do we're doing the most cost-effective thing 
with our, with our resources. But I don't know, I mean, I don't know that I would, if, as governor, I would have put up, you know, what is, there it is, five billion dollars for Amazon, but I do think for our region, it could be very, it would, might be good for us to attract an Amazon headquarters in, um, in Montgomery County. In the same way that Montgomery County and Baltimore City and Howard County were very supportive of us here in Prince George's County trying to attract uh, the FBI. And so we have to have a partnership with our counties because chances are whether those jobs are located over there or someplace else, people in Prince George's County may be going, uh, going to those jobs. And as to our existing uh, road and sort of surface infrastructure, uh, again, I, I, I think the federal government is going to have to, and we hear inklings of this, step up and develop a serious transportation and infrastructure solution so that our federal dollars are going to uh, support our federal roadways, but that the money that comes to the state, uh, that we engage in the kind of partnerships we need so that we're able to fix our state roads and then make sure that we have resources for our, our, our county roads. And again, it's about putting us on a plan for doing these things in a way that doesn't wait until they fall apart. For example, when I was in Congress, I got money to, the, to help to fix the overpasses on the Suitland Parkway. Well, you know what jump-started that? A woman almost getting killed on Suitland Parkway. When the bridge fell down in Minnesota, the um, Congress, people had been asking Congress for money for a long time to have that bridge fixed. You know what spurred us putting money to that? It falling down and killing people. And so we cannot continue, as, even as a county, um, to operate in that, in that kind of way. But we do have to be able to do multiple things at a time to make sure that we take care of today's needs, but that we're put in a position that we are taking care of our future, uh, our future needs and where it is that we want to be. I think Reverend Ray was next. Oh, yes. So let me say a couple of things about the model that we have currently um, for the school system. Uh, I was not a supporter of removing all of our, basically half of our elected uh, school board. Um, it, because I always think that people in communities, one should, ha should know who it is that they can go to, to either complaint or support or whatever it is who's their voice on a school board. And, um, but this is the design that we have. But I was not in favor of it. What I will tell you is that as county executive, I will appoint someone as CEO of the school system who believes that it is his or her responsibility to be accountable um, to, uh, to parents, to educators, and to taxpayers. As county executive, I know that the, uh, the school budget, as I described earlier, consumes about 60% of, uh, of all of our budget here in the county. It should at least consume some fair amount of the county executive's time to know what is going on with more precise detail um, in the school system. I will tell you this, that as county executive, I will not reward failure to deliver by any superintendent. And I want to share this with you because I think that this can come off very harsh, but let me tell you something. When I was in Congress was when Prince George's County lost the Head Start funding. That was an unnecessary loss of $7 million a year of Head Start funding. That is not a success, that is a failure. Prince George's County public school system was given three, three opportunities to cure the problem before the Administration for Children and Families removed Head Start funding. Head Start funding supports some of our most needy students to give them what it says, a head start so that they are ready uh, for kindergarten. And so I think it is an abject failure that we lost that money. I will tell you that as county executive, 
I will make certain that if we are graduating students, that they are meeting the requirements for graduation and that we're not faking them out, we're not faking parents out, and we're not putting pressure on educators um, it, to just move people through the system. I will say to you that as county executive, when it comes to appointments to the school board, they're gonna be people who have um, solid education experience. I won't be appointing any of my relatives, as qualified as I think they are, um, to be on the school board or to be any place else in our government. And so that's my vision of how it is that you run a system that has accountability uh, to all of the layers uh, that are in the system. But that is not what happens now. Now, if our, our delegation makes the argument to the state that um, we're gonna change the structure again, you know what, as county executive, I'm gonna live with whatever structure is delivered because to me, it's not the structure, it's the accountability um, that needs to happen in the system so that we are educating students and preparing them uh, to go out into the economy. So let me just back up a little bit because um, I, I am one of those persons who believes that if your taxes are being used to better your community, to strengthen your education system, to grow your economic base, uh, to provide for a community that is doing what it needs to do, then I'll pay my taxes. Here's the problem that we've had in Prince George's County. I, I came here right about the time, I guess, that uh, the, the trim tax measure was, was put into place. And part of the reason that that happened, not all of the reason, but part of the reason was a trust factor. Do the taxpayers in Prince George's County trust its elected officials to make judicious decisions about how it is that we spend their resources. In an up year, um, making a decision that we may need more taxes in order to um, strengthen and build our communities. In a down year, we might think about that differently. Here in Prince George's County, our elected officials do not have the flexibility to do that. And I think that that poses a structural problem for us for the long run. Um, and, you know, and we are going to have to deal with that structural problem, but not until we deal with the issue of trust in this county. And I think that there's good reason that the taxpayers were a little bit distrustful of what was happening at the elected level uh, here in Prince George's County. That said, it is also true that because of that structural problem, we rely more heavily on our property taxes to do all of the things that we need to do than other jurisdictions do. As I said, over the long haul, that poses a tremendous danger for us because there's only so much uh, that you can tax even property owners. Now, if you look at uh, over what's happened over a couple of years, um, I, I can recall over the years where at the 11th hour during a council session, somebody tried to sneak in a repeal to trim. And I can recall this happening several times. Well, I don't believe, I'm a, I'm a good government advocate. I mean, I spent several years on the board, uh, the National Governing Board of Common Cause. I started out working on campaign finance and ethics reform. I don't believe in sneaking things by the taxpayer. If there was a need to make a change in trim, I believe it's the obligation of the county executive and our elected officials to go around the county and educate voters about 
what it is that we're spending our money on and be transparent about that and then make a case to them. I don't think that that case has been made. And so first up, when I become county executive, is going to be to get a, get a handle of our budget, to share our expenditures, what it is that we're doing openly with the, uh, with the public. And so all of us will be able to see where it is that we need to make change, how it is that we need to fix, uh, fix the system. And frankly, I think until those things happen, there is not a reason that the public should trust us with the ability to do what other counties do, which is make decisions up and down year to year about where it is that they need resources to meet their obligations. I don't believe that we're there yet, but when I'm elected county executive, we are going to get there in four years so that we can openly have that conversation about how it is that we deal with this structural issue, not behind doors, not by trying to sneak something onto the ballot, but by being upfront and honest with the citizens and taxpayers here in Prince George's County. You know your members. <laughs> uh, well, all right. Well, 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 you do in Atlanta, which is uh, when there was, uh, which would mean that we've got a sizable amount of corruption in the Prince George's County school system. And we need to have uh, real prosecutors together with a team of like, Atlanta was 60, 60 state in, uh, investigators, and give them a year to root out all the corruption, which is of which the um, the graduation rate is just is one part. Um, when a a Angela Walter Brooks was here, uh, she, she bragged that that, that uh, she put a pedophile from one of the schools in jail forever. And I asked her, well, what about the principal who protected him for years? But so we need a real a serious investigation, not just of the of the graduation rate, but but uh, but also uh, child abuse as well as uh, tremendous misspending of, of money. Uh, if you are elected and they don't change the what do you call it? The governance of the school system. Well, then the, the current uh, school CEO will stay in. Will stay. Will stay there for several more years. Well, first of all, let, let me just say. Let me just say. Let me just say this. Um, it's a contract, and um, and I think any elected um, a, a official that comes in as the county executive has the ability to look at all of the contracts. Um, that we have here in this in this county. Look, I'm a lawyer, so I know you don't break contracts easily. Um, but I also know that um, you know we have a circumstance where, as I said earlier, I believe that failure has been rewarded, and I don't think that that is acceptable. I believe that malfeasance has been rewarded, and I don't think that's acceptable. And that's going to be the first order of business when I become county executive. But let, let's let's go back to the system because. I'm not going to take it as a given that the entire system is corrupt, because I think that that is, a very, that is a somewhat defeatist attitude to take about it. But what I will say is it's important for us to get to the bottom of whatever is going on, to root that out, and to start fresh. And as I said before, I do not believe that we're in a situation that if somebody is telling you that we just need to make a tweak here and a tweak there, that is, that is not what is going to uh, fix what is happening in our, in our school system. When I go back to the budget and I think about a $1.9 uh, $1 billion budget and I look and I see that so much of it is heavily weighted at the executive administrative level and I have to ask myself, what do all those people do? Um, and, and what do they do when we have students who are not meeting graduation um, uh, requirements where we have um, too many students in the classroom, where we have 
uh, hundreds of teachers on administrative leave so that in core classes, students have had already in this, um, in this season three and four substitutes in English and math and science. That is not a recipe for success. And it is not an indication that the current management is doing what they need to do to make sure that our students are educated. And so I'm not going to say it's corrupt, but what I will tell you is that if there is corruption, I'm going to get to the bottom of it. Um, one last question, and then we'll have to move on. Conrad. Um, the, the topic is affordable housing. The county has before it a number of suggestions from a group called Enterprise to provide a number of different options that the county has. Uh, Mayor Jordan and I attended the a uh, very, very serious and uplifting ceremony of the Purple Line Coalition, mm -hmm. where both Montgomery and Prince George's counties agreed together to commit to making sure that those communities along the Purple Line would not experience the same problems that happened with U, the View Street Corridor, where the entire character was changed. Yeah. How, what are your ideas, plans, in terms of making sure that what happened with U Street doesn't happen with the Purple Line stops in Prince George's County. Well, thank you. I'm really glad that you raised that. Actually, just last Saturday, I was over at La Chapina Bakery um, over in, um, in Langley Park, and I was meeting with a group of business owners and community members who lived there who actually expressed exactly the same thing. Um, I, when I was in Congress, I really tried to work with our, our county council to try to actually even get some resources to help mitigate what is going to be inevitable disruption of their businesses. What many of those business owners, for example, and they're small businesses, I mean, they're mom and pop businesses. They start from scratch, they work all, all day, every day to build their business. Their rents are starting to shoot up like crazy. Um, and, and I think that part of those things are in, in an effort to move out parts of the community, and I don't find that acceptable at all. And I think that, but I think that there also is a way to deal with it. You know, for example, I believe in when you're doing economic development that you should be doing mixed income housing in areas because when you have mixed income communities, I mean, some of that is demonstrated here in Greenbelt. When you have mixed income communities, they are actually much more thriving and successful communities, and particularly when they're built around transportation infrastructure and when they engage local and small businesses. When I was, um, when I was at La Chapina, um, I was talking with some of the business owners and sharing with them that, you know, when you think about their businesses, they're all hiring people who are right there in the local community. They're not like some outside something that, and they build a thing and then they go away. They're hiring right there in the community. They're a vibrant part of the community. If you think about that stretch, um, you know, New Hampshire Avenue and across um, 193, it is a truly remarkable international corridor. Um, and that, should, that is a value for this community. You know, Prince George's County has something like 200,000 residents who are foreign-born residents. That's one in five people in our county who are foreign-born residents. And so, you know, this is not like some isolated thing to try to make sure you preserve the character and the dignity of a community that's there. And I believe that both in our zoning and planning processes, this is why I was say, saying to you early, earlier, it's important to nail down those community benefits agreements with developers at the outset. Too often what happens in this county, and it happened to us when we were working on, you know, trying to change the character of National Harbor, that basically the deal had been cut, the tax breaks had been sealed, uh, the zoning was done, and then they came to us in the community and said, what do you think of our project? And we said, well, we didn't think very much of it. And we challenged them. The only problem is that at that point, our only opportunity was to go to court to challenge them, which we did, and we won. And that is why that community is, looks, that project looks different right now. When we challenged them, part of our lawsuit that we won in the settlement was having residents who lived there because we believed that you couldn't have a successful community unless there were people who actually lived at the project. We got that in our lawsuit. It wasn't even part of the original plan, if you can believe that. 
That, if, have any of you been over to National Harbor where that, you see that hiking and biking trail along there? That was part of our lawsuit. They weren't even going to have access to the river. That's a, an amenity uh, to the community. Now, I don't want to go around like Sue and every developer. We should have a strategy where we work with developers at the outset. We sit down with the communities at the beginning and not at the tail end so that we can negotiate a project that really can work for all of us. And I believe that we can do those things. And that's, that is the way that I will pursue economic development in this, in this county. And when I think about some of these metro corridors, you know, Capitol Heights and along Addison Road, um, these stops are through, um, through older communities that have existed in this county almost, you know, you know just after the beginning of the, of the county. And they are part of who we are. And so the, ideally what you would do is you'd want to develop around there by engaging the community and making sure that there were resources for the small businesses to continue to thrive in addition to adding the 21st century amenities that you need in a community. But that would be my approach to economic development. I'm going to let Bill have his follow-up question, but then we do need to move on because I know there's another event that some people want to get to. So. All right, thank you. Uh, I was not present when the budget and Baker signed that agreement. I've not seen that agreement. I'm told there's nothing in that agreement that uh, clearly preserves the right to have the residents of the community to raise the domain in the corridor. I'm pleased with what I just heard you say about post uh, the National Harbor development. Well, why not uh, uh, say, for example, rent control and all develop and developing uh, corridors and activity centers in the county? And if, if one is developing, like the Purple Line corridor, uh, even if there is redevelopment, people will know that uh, they can return at essentially the same rents, commercial or residential, to the new buildings that will inevitably uh, develop across the board. I think those are good ideas. I mean, but I mean, I think what we have to do is we have to look at who it is that we want to be. And if that means that, and if we decide, which I believe that we should, that we want to make an investment in preserving our older communities, our cultural uh, uh, communities, our cultural heritage um, in the county, then we have to have an economic development model that is intentional about doing that. And so I think there are a number of strategies uh, that you could undertake. Some of the ways in which, for example, um, I'll, I'll use this as an example, it may not be the best one, but when the, when the silver line was put in along, um, I guess it's Route 7, um, when the silver line was put in, they made a point of going to each one of those business owners and negotiating how it is that the the construction was going to take place so that businesses would continue to have uh, access, so that, they would, so that the design itself would continue to make sure that, um, that they were part of the community and that they wouldn't just be wiped away. Um, those are the kinds of things that we can do here. And we have a lot, you know, if you think about uh, the county, we have a lot of areas where I mean, they're not exactly municipalities, but they're just kind of communities. And they're run down. They're storefronts that are run down. When you begin to invest in improving those kind of things in a, in a community, people then begin to take real pride in it. They start picking up the, uh, the trash. They um, start to take care of their storefronts. They become safer uh, communities. And so I think that there is a way for us to do that. And here in Prince George's County, if we invest in that kind of economic development model, it will be an attraction for others to come and live here. And particularly if we make certain that we're investing in mixed income communities and that there is intentionality about doing that. Anyway, I've talked a long time. And so I'm going to say thank you uh, very much for having me here. If you want to come, uh, and, and have an additional conversation with us, please sign up on our website at www.donnaforprincegeorges.org. Uh, I'd really appreciate it. We really invite your interest. I've been doing coffee conversations at coffee shops all around, um, uh, around the county at uh, senior um, centers and community centers. And I am looking forward uh, to the prospect of representing 
Prince George's County. This is my home. I am here. And if I'm going to be here, I'm going to make a contribution. And I think that when I make a contribution as county executive, it means that our entire county is going to be making a contribution, too. Anyway, thank you very much. And don't forget to vote on June 26. And for those who are not familiar, here's our wish box. And the wish box, we just simply invite you to come up and put a dollar or two in the wish box and make a wish. And the proceeds that are placed into the wish box goes to the Greenbelt Emergency Relief Fund um, to provide financial assistance for a Greenbelt resident who may have an emergency hardship type of situation. And so all of the money that goes into the wish box is donated um, to the Greenbelt Emergency Relief Fund. And so, I don't know if anyone has a wish, Conrad? I've been doing a lot of uh, research about Robert Kennedy, and it strikes me that uh, Kennedy was 180 degrees from the current president, <laughs> and which isn't hard to do, but uh, in, that, in that spirit of bringing the country together rather than dividing us as much as possible, that I contribute, it's not much, but one dollar to the wish box. Yes. Um, my wish is very simple. Same as this gentleman being able to go out. He's across the country. Um, less efficient. And especially since I came over to Greenbelt um, for Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt, who created jobs and opportunity by giving people an opportunity to succeed no matter who they were. And I like, I adore these folks. I mean, it's like Social Security that then led to Medicare. It's like housing. It's like, you know, working in communities and cleaning up parks and things like that. And I think that we can do those things too. And so my wish is for the kind of communities all across the county that Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt would have been proud of. Anyone else, Jerry? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll second what Donna just said. And I, I, sure, I sure hope that uh, there'll be a serious investigation of what's happening in the school system. And I could, I could put out a flyer on, on some of it, and they're over here. And so I have a wish, but I'm not going to say what it is because I really want it to come true. I have a wish because I believe that the 60,000 high school students that graduated from Prince George's County Schools didn't have an opportunity to have all laptops. I have a wish that all 60,000 oh, High school students get laptops this year. <laughs> Any others? Well, I have a wish. Um, I am wishing that Congress will get themselves together and actually has, you know, this thing called a budget, 
Um, I know that's hopeful, um, wishing on my part, but to just stop the continuing resolutions that go on for three weeks here, a month or two there, and bring some type of stability and continuity um, to our federal government. And so that's my wish. Yes. I have a wish that everybody pays attention to their responsibility to vote. I have a wish that we focus more on mental health awareness in Prince George's County. Um, well, the other thing we had when you first came in, there was a jar by the table, and you might have saw a little Scottish Terrier on the jar. And that jar is for our fallow fund. And for those who don't know, uh, FDR's little Scottish Terrier, his name was Fallow. And if you have um, a little bit of change in your pocket, we accept all kinds, the kind that jingles and the kind that folds. Um, if you can put it in the fallow fund, uh, the proceeds from the fallow fund go towards the club's efforts in supporting uh, Democratic candidates who are running for office. And so we don't get involved in primaries, um, but we do try to make a contribution uh, to various candidates in the general election um, who are running for office. I know last year we made a contribution to several women who were running for Senate across the country uh, through EMILY's List. And so we want to try to continue those efforts. And so if you're able to make a donation before you leave to the ballot fund, that would be awesome. Um, we have, we normally don't do this, but I know there have been, a, there's several folks here who are running for various offices. I know Calvin Hawkins was here earlier, um, who was running for at large. Um, I think there's someone here with Victor Ramirez. You want to wave your hand? Okay. Um, who's running for state's attorney. We have our own delegate, Delegate Alonzo Washington, who I believe is running for re-election. I think so. Okay. <laughs> um, we also have David Grogan in the back who's running for sheriff. Um, did I miss anyone else? Yourself. Myself. Um, I, <laughs> uh, I'm running for delegate as well um, in District 22. I'm Nicole Williams for those who came in late. And I think that's about it. So I just wanted to make sure I acknowledge those individuals. And so does anyone have any other announcements or go to the order? Conrad. Just a, a quick one. On Monday, March 12th at 7 p.m., the Prince George's Arts and Humanities Council is holding a forum for the county executive candidates. It's only going to be about the arts, but I think there's a lot to talk about regarding the arts. So it's March 12th, a few Mondays from now, at the Clarice Smith Performing Arts Center. Any other announcements? Delegate Washington? Do I want to say something for the order? Yes. Uh, sure. Um, you know, we're in a legislative session right now. We just overturned two, two, two of the governor's meetings. Uh, one to uh, make sure that folks when they apply for college don't have to check that box to say whether or not they went to jail or they were, were, were um, sentenced or in prison or not. And then there was another one that we passed that we overturned was also the um, paid sick leave bill. Um, now we now we can earn sick leave in, in the state of Maryland now because of that. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, so our next meeting, I know we've changed up the meeting dates and times, and so hopefully everyone's checking their email, and we're trying to update the website as much as possible. Our next meeting is going to be Sunday, February 11th, and at that meeting we are going to have a short documentary about the life of Fannie Lou Hamer for Black History Month, and we are also going to have the director of that short documentary um, with us um, on that Sunday to talk about the documentary talk about the life of Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, and so I think it's going to be a really, really great meeting, a really great presentation. Um, so if you're able to make it out, uh, please mark your calendar for Sunday, February 11th. Um, at 3 o'clock. Right here, same location. <laughs> All right. Um, and unless anyone has anything else, Okay, I think we are adjourned. There are more snacks and refreshments in the back. Please eat up so I don't have to take it home. And thank you. <laughs>